Well, this is a moment I've been looking for for a while. Um, just a quick introduction for um, Pastor Jan Hedinga. He uh, grew up in Wisconsin area, was called later into the uh, greater Seattle area. He's been there for a number of years. And um, we we'll want the microphone. Uh, my first exposure to Jan was uh, by uh, having someone put the book Follow Me in my hands and uh, just uh, sort of changed my way of thinking about church and Christian life. And uh, so we had the opportunity to have him come. And so he's going to be here uh, this service, Sunday school, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, and then 6.30 Monday and Tuesday nights. And I just hope you give him your attention and uh, open up your heart to what the Holy Spirit would want to say to you uh, this morning and the other times when he has the uh, pulpit. So Jan, would you please come? Thank you, Mark. What a privilege to be with you and to worship with you. That was great fun, just singing to our wonderful Lord. I, uh, I'm the oldest in a family of four. Uh, come from dairy farming country in central Wisconsin, and most of my uncles and both of my grand on both sides, my grandparents had dairy farms. So uh, I know pretty much about what small town agricultural uh, economies are like and uh, have shoveled my share of whatever. <laughs> I'm also a grandfather and uh, we have 11 grandchildren. Anybody relate to that? Grandparents? All right. Um, our latest two came from Korea. Our oldest son and his wife, Amy, Nathan and Amy, adopted two uh, little boys from Korea. And uh, the first one they adopted, they named Isaac. Or rather, Isaiah, I'm sorry. Isaiah. And he, uh, he hears from the Lord. I, I, I don't know if it's genetic. It couldn't be from me uh, because he's Korean. But uh, he came out uh, about two weeks ago and uh, came out of his room and he said, Dad, I had a dream. And his dad said, really, why don't you tell me about it? He said, well, God spoke to me. He said, really, what did God say? He said, well, God said, Daddy, you're not supposed to spank me anymore. <laughs> He's three years old. <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing about that is he had figured out that his dad was under authority. That there was somebody above him. And he was appealing to that authority. Not exactly honestly. <laughs> but uh, he was trying to intimidate his dad with a higher authority. We're going to talk about that whole issue of who's in charge uh, throughout these days that I'm here with you. And uh, I would encourage you to come as often as you can. It'll only make sense if you get as much of it as possible. If you've already read the book, Follow Me, you have a good slice of it, but that was written 15 years ago, and a lot has happened since, that you'll hear it in a different way now. It'll go deeper. And... Uh, I think, I think it will benefit your life. I think it will benefit your marriage, your family, uh, your future. That's why I'm here, to be a blessing to you and uh, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this group of people who are precious in your sight. They're part of the flock of God. Each one of them has a story that you have been writing. Each one of them has a different uh, relationship with you. You love us individually. You relate to us as individuals. And even though we gather here as a group, we know that your Holy Spirit is going to be active in each one of our hearts 
And so we ask for that now. We ask, Lord, that you would remove any and all barriers. That whatever sin issues we came into this room with, that right now, you, by your Spirit, would convict us and convince us. And may we turn from it and cleanse ourselves so that we can hear from you. Lord, if there's any grudges that anyone has toward you, any anger toward you, any disappointment with you, Lord, I ask that they would set that aside this morning so that they can hear from you. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would come with power through your word, that each one of us would know we have heard from God today. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I was preaching through the Gospel of John. I was in John chapter 3, and that's the story of Jesus in his conversation with Nicodemus. And of course, we, for most of us, John 3.16 is one of the most precious verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that conversation with Nicodemus begins the chapter. And as I read it and reread it, I was preparing for my message for Sunday. Um, I started to cross-reference. I started to check and look at other passages in the New Testament, or try to look for other passages that would talk about being born again, because that's the language Jesus was using with Nicodemus. And finally, after about an hour of searching the scriptures in frustration, I just simply wrote on a, on a piece of paper on my desk, Nicodemus is the only person Jesus said you must be born again to. Why then had I been trained all my life to use that kind of language with everybody? If Jesus only used it with one man. And so I, I picked up the New Testament, and that afternoon I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking for what it was Jesus said consistently. And of course, if you've read the New Testament recently, you, you know, you remember. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being here, the kingdom of heaven having arrived in himself. And then his next sentence was, repent and believe the good news. So the good news was the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. And the response Jesus was asking for was repentance. And what I'm going to do this morning is try to make sense of that for you, so that by the time you leave in the next 40 minutes or so, you will say, I think I get it. I think I understand what Jesus was talking about. So let's start back in the beginning, because if you're going to be a Bible student, everything starts in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 3, which is the passage that we call the entrance of sin into the world. The perfect creation, the paradise of the Garden of Eden is suddenly spoiled by a deliberate choice on the part of Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That subtle deception, maybe not so subtle, is the kind of lying that Satan is still doing to the human race and to each of us. He simply questions God, raises doubts about God's goodness, and about God's intentions toward us. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and silent. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from his presence, the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I have I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. What happened back there in the garden? What went wrong? I'd like to uh, have you think quickly with me about the essence of what we did as a human race when we entered into what the Bible calls sin. So we're basically defining sin this morning. What is it? What has gone wrong? What is the problem? The nature of what's wrong is just simply this. God has, and I'm going to get my pen working so I can write on this. God has all, always had a kingdom. He has always been God. He has always been in control. He's always been in charge. He's always been the owner and operator of the universe. And in the kingdom of God, one will is supreme. That doesn't mean that uh, nobody, that everybody's a robot. It just simply means God is the leader and everybody in the kingdom of God says, that's okay with me. You're the leader. God gave creatures in his kingdom freedom of choice. And the first group of beings that he gave freedom of choice to was a group of angels. They were apparently high and privileged angels, probably the administration of God's universe, uh, beings that God trusted uh, with responsibility because they're called principalities and powers and rulers, uh, led by a, an angel by the name of Lucifer, the angel of light, a, a glorious angel who got lifted up in pride and decided he could run the universe better than God, and he rebelled. And he took with him a significant group of angels who chose to go with him rather than stay in the kingdom of God. So that's how the kingdom of darkness began. Then there's the creation of Adam and Eve, and Lucifer is already here. Through the serpent, he tempts Adam and Eve. And what they choose to do is to join him in this rebellion. In other words, what happened is Adam and Eve left the kingdom of darkness, or kingdom of light, and joined the kingdom of darkness. Now I want you to notice what I've done here with all of these little castles. Each human being builds their own castle. It's not like we, you know, it's not like we didn't want to be under God and now we want to be under Satan or Lucifer. Oh no. We want to be under ourselves. And so what we do is we each build our own kingdom, and that's the nature of life in the kingdom of darkness. It is an incredibly uh, conflicted situation where, as you know, in this world, 
It's neighbor against neighbor, nation against nation. Our history as a human race is a history of war and violence and crime and murder. Why? Why is that the case? Well, it's because we each have gone our own way and we've become self-centered and we've built our own little kingdom and we, just, we, we have to defend it. We, we've got to keep each other from controlling us. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So we've got a world out from under God. And uh, this, is, this really meshes with reality. The kingdom of darkness has two parts to it. It has a kingdom of fallen angels. This is the invisible <coughs> kingdom. It has principalities, as we mentioned, powers, rulers of the darkness, and demons. We're not going to take time to explain what the differences are there, except that there are there's a hierarchy of fallen angels. There are very powerful fallen angels, there are less powerful fallen angels, and demons are kind of the rank and file. Then there's the kingdoms of this world. And the kingdoms of this world are made up of the governments of the nations. In the, in the Bible, if you actually do a word study on the nations, the nations are never in agreement with God. In fact, today, there is no such thing as a Christian nation on the face of the earth. This country certainly is not a Christian nation, if it ever was. In other words, we do what is right in our own eyes as human beings, and as groups of human beings. So a nation is a group of people, like we know of in our country, who, who operate in what they perceive to be their own self-interest. And of course, when you're operating in your self-interest, and another nation is operating in their self-interest, what happens is that you compete for natural resources, for influence, for power, and that's why we have rivalries all over the world with other nations. Now I want you to, to know that the principalities and powers are involved here. They operate through the kingdoms of this world. You say, oh, I, don't, I don't see anything demonic about government. <laughs> I hope you're not that naive. Um, you listen, if you listen uh, to C-SPAN and some of the, uh, the televised you know, workings of, of the government, and you listen to some of those meetings and some of those sessions of Congress and the Senate and so forth, I, when I listen to that, I just go away shaking my head. What are these people thinking? How could intelligent people who, who seem to want to do the right thing make these kinds of decisions? It's crazy. All right, what's going on? They're being deceived. They're being misled. The voices in their ears, in their hearts, are the voices of the principalities and powers. They are influenced by the kingdom of darkness. And so they play into it. So here's, here's the situation. Whether it's, whether it's in groups, like nations or tribes, or whether it's we as individuals, the kingdom of self and control is our dilemma. This is where we find ourselves. We operate, we think best, under self-government. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And when we all have that attitude, we've got a very, very serious problem. So it's a rejection of God's authority, His right to lead and tell us how to live. It's a spirit of independence, autonomy, and it feels like freedom. In other words, it feels necessary. It feels like what we need to do to be human. I need to be able to make my own choices. I need to be in control of my life. But what this does is actually create a huge gap, a huge barrier between us and God. Because the, the legitimate leader, 
the God we have misused and victimized with our self-will and our self-centeredness is still there and he's still God. We sang about it this morning. He is the unchangeable God, the unstoppable God, the unshakable God. I'm so glad we sang that song. Amen. But we're separated from him. You say, well, how, how can that be? I thought God is love. I thought God loves us. How, how could this barrier come just because we went our own way? Well, think about it. Those of you who have been parents, or who are parents now, what happens when your sweet little son or daughter looks you in the eye and says, I do not like living under your rules. I am going to do as I please. I'm going to listen to the music I want to listen to. I'm going to have the friends I want to have. I'll come in when I want to come into the house at night. You're not going to tell me what to do anymore. I'm taking charge of my life. Now, you love the child. That hasn't changed. You're offended. It's an in-your-face. I mean, this is the moment, you know, when you get angry. I mean, you, you flush. You, what? After all I've done for you? And then you start going back over, you know, I've fed you, I've clothed you, I've given you this, I've given you that, and now this is the way you treat me? What's going on here? If that child does not repent of that spirit of rebellion towards you, it doesn't matter how much you love them. The relationship has been broken. What some parents do, and this is craziness, but they say, okay, okay, okay. You, you can do what you want, and, and I'll kind of join you. So, you, you want to drink? Well, let's drink together. At least I know where you are. You want to smoke? Well, let's smoke together. Because at least I know how much you smoke. You want to have the friends you want to have, listen to the music you want to listen to, Okay, let's do it here in our family room. I'll try to understand. Boy, is that a mistake. You cannot accommodate this attitude. Your, your kids will despise you for accommodating them. That's the work. When a child determines they're going to go their own way, separation is the inevitable result even if you're God and love perfectly. It's just the way it works. Let's talk about the home. You've got a husband and a wife, a dad and a mom. And at the heart of every marriage, every marriage is a power struggle over who's going to be in control. There are no exceptions. You say, well, we never had a problem with that. Now, you solved the problem, probably when you were courting. You made a decision. One of you decided to be dominant, and one of you decided to be compliant. Or, you've never solved the problem, and you fight all the time. <laughs> I can't tell you how many homes I've been in where if she says it's black, he says it's white. If she says it happened yesterday, he says it happened the day before. They constantly bicker and fight over the tiniest little details. What is that about? Is that just pettiness? No. That's about control issues. All right? Then you have children. And every one of your children has your DNA. And every one of them starts showing their own control issues. Their own desire to have their own way. And that adds to the conflict. And then Grandma moves in. <laughs> and she never did like her son-in-law. <laughs> but she also has a problem with her daughter for marrying her son-in-law. And then you get a couple of girls in the family, and the daughter and the son don't get along real well, and the daughter and the dad don't get along real well. And the baby sister is a totally self-centered being, which all babies are. Um, I don't know if you know that. Have you ever stopped to think 
that children absolutely give you nothing except a warm feeling when you hold them. Children are takers. Infants want to be changed when they want to be changed. They want to be fed when they want to be fed. They don't care whether you're tired or not. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning, it has nothing to do with it. Your comfort has nothing to do with it in their world. Their needs are central. All right? What do we call parenting or child rearing? You're trying to teach a child to think of somebody other than themselves, right? A home with people who are self-centered, who want their own way, who want to be in control, is a taste of hell. It's a painful place. I don't know how many times now, in fact, I, I rarely talk to somebody who doesn't say, I came from a dysfunctional family. What are they talking about? They're talking about the power struggles and the conflict and the exhibited selfishness, the acted out control issues of their family, of origin. And they call it dysfunction. Well, of course it's dysfunction. Its root is in the fall. Its root is in the dilemma of the human race. I even threw the dog in because especially Yorkshire Terriers. <laughs> we had a little dog named Princess Anne, and she thought she was the queen, not the princess. God's diagnosis is very clear in Scripture. What I've done here is synthesize the major and the minor prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, major prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I learned that in Sunday school. It still uh, sticks with me. I'm glad for a Sunday school teacher who made me learn the books of the Bible. But the prophets are a big chunk of the Bible. You know that. About a third of the Bible is the prophets. It's the part we read least. And one of the reasons we don't read it very often is because it's so hard on us. It has such a negative view of the human race, and it's constantly analyzing and diagnosing the human problem. So these words are being used, trespass, transgress, obstinacy, obstinacy stubbornness, unrighteousness, Lawlessness, disobedience, unholiness, iniquity, selfish pride, rejection of authority, on and on and on. And these are words for sin, capital S, singular. These are not words for symptomatic sins like lying, stealing, cheating, committing adultery, murder. Those are sins, but they're symptoms of the root cause sin. The Bible is incredibly clear about the root cause. If you, start, if you start boiling this down, what is this? You get your arms around all 50 words that are used in the prophets for sin singular. You come up with defiance toward authority or toward God, rebellion, and a horrible self-centeredness. Is this accurate to uh, human experience? Oh, yeah. Over the years, I've, I've pastored uh, for 30 years now in, in Seattle, and it's a, a great, great place to pastor. I have a wonderful church, but as I as I work with couples, couple after couple, day after day, come in and they tell me how hard their partner is to live with, and how difficult their marriage is. And without exception, they say this, he is so selfish. Or she is so self-focused. And I can't stand it. 
So they come in when they're in crisis, of course, and then I try to get them uh, to, to deal with it as a, a process, but this is so true. This attitude of self-centeredness, this spirit of self-centeredness, is a terrible dilemma, and we all face it. Every marriage struggles with it, and every family struggles with it, because that is the nature of our problem. Now, let me just say this. Trespass, transgress, obstinacy, stubbornness, what are we talking about? When you trespass, what do you do? Any of you have no trespass signs up? Does your neighbor have no trespass signs? Okay. What does it mean to trespass? To go where you know a boundary has been set. To go beyond the boundary, deliberately. I know there's a fence there. I know it's posted. But I'm going over there anyway because I just shot a pheasant and it flew over in his field. Or uh, the stream runs through his property or their property and there's a couple of holes down in there that really need to be fished. Or whatever excuse it is. How about transgress? What does it mean to transgress? Okay, you've got, a, you've got a speed limit. It's right out there on the highway. By the way, what is, what's the normal speed limit around here? On the 70? On the freeway. How about on the side roads? 55. 55, all right. And in town? 45, 35, what is it? <laughs> Whatever you can get away with, right? Okay. To transgress is to know what the law is and to say, well, you know, in these circumstances, I'm going to have to transgress the law. I'm late for my doctor's appointment. Or I'm late for getting my kid to school or to their sporting event. I've got to go faster than the speed limit if I'm going to get there on time. So we rationalize and excuse transgression. In essence, when you, when you take all of these things and wrap them up, by the way, a word like iniquity, it sounds like something really gooey, sticky, slimy, ugly, right? You know what it is? Remember Isaiah 53, 6? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And God laid on him, Jesus, it's a prophetic passage, the iniquity of us all. What's iniquity according to that verse? Going your own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. So when you go your own way, you're committing iniquity. If you wrap all of this up, what you're talking about is an authority problem. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. And that's God's complaint for the whole human race. And that's our complaint. If you're trying to lead, And everybody has their own idea about the way it should go. You got a serious problem. So Jesus, I'm saying, used the same uh, diagnosis. And Genesis 3, 1 to 13, is about this revolution or this revolt or rebellion, which now has created the chaos that is, is on our planet. So the gospel is God's plan for ending the rebellion. Not just for forgiving it. It does forgive our sins. But that, isn't, that doesn't make sense. If you were the leader, would, is that what you would do? I forgive you, but I know you're going to keep doing it. 
I forgive you and I, I can't help you with your obsession with wanting your own way. Absolutely not. The cross of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And we're not just saved from the penalty of sin. We are saved from the power of sin. And that means we are saved from our revolt, our revolution, our rebellion. That is what God is after. He is after bringing us back into His family and into His kingdom. Surrender to His will. And that's what salvation is designed to do. Let me just take a look now at what Jesus actually said, all right? Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. This is John the Baptist, and he's preaching. Uh, he, he was an incredible guy. Sometimes we think of John the Baptist in the caricatured stereotype that some people have have made him out to be, uh, you know, kind of the sandwich board, repent or perish kind of a guy. He was a dynamic speaker. I mean, you cannot, you've got to have something on the wall if you get thousands of people to come out in the desert to hear you preach. You can't be a klutz. All right, he was an incredible leader and speaker. And his message, according to the New Testament, could be summed up as repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now he said a lot of things. I mean, you know he told stories, you know he had different topics for his sermons, but the Holy Spirit, in putting it all in a nutshell, says this is what it, this is his message. In one sentence, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. After John was put in prison, this is Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Same message as John the Baptist. And again, this is a summary statement. Here's another one. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So these are summary statements. Jesus, you, you know Jesus told many stories. He told parables. He was an eloquent speaker. Uh, his words, the scripture said, were like ointment poured forth. He was a fascinating person to listen to. But when the Holy Spirit says, let's boil this all down, what was he saying? In a nutshell, he was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. 423, Matthew. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people, demonstrating his power and his authority. But Jesus said in, in Luke 4:43, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Now, the good news is where we get the word gospel. The gospel Jesus preached was the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. Luke 9, 2, he's training his disciples, in the twelve in particular. Jesus sent them, the twelve, out to preach the kingdom of God, so he's training them in the same message that he used, and to heal the sick. Luke 9, 6 continues the story, it says, so they went out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. We know what gospel they had been trained in, the gospel of the kingdom. And they, the twelve, went out and preached that people should repent. Same message that Jesus gave. Now, I'm, I'm going to cut it short here. There are many references to the message of Jesus we don't have time to go into today. But one in particular I'd like to show you, and that is the other Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was giving that prophetic sermon in Matthew 24. He said this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world to all nations, and then the end will come. In other words, Jesus did not intend that the content of the gospel change. This gospel of the kingdom the gospel he was preaching was to go to all the world, to all nations, until 
the end. You'll see why this is, I'm making a point of this. One more reference, this is John 18, the conversation between Jesus and Pilate. Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now, my kingdom is from another place. You're a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you're right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, to testify to the truth, the truth about who he was. The identity of Jesus, I am the king of the universe, was the essence of his message. So, what gospel do we use? We just took a look at what gospel Jesus used. Here are some familiar phrases that you've heard if you've been in Bible teaching churches, evangelical churches like this one. And by the way, I know that this church is a bit different probably a lot different from most evangelical churches. I know Pastor Mark well enough to know that he uses the gospel of the kingdom and the categories uh, of theology that underline that. But this is what you hear on Christian radio, in Christian books, in Christian conferences, Christian camps. Believe the good news of God's love in Jesus. Accept the gift of God's grace. Receive God's love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Commit your life to Christ. Make a decision for Christ. Pray the sinner's prayer. Here's some more. Let Jesus come into your heart. We use that a lot with children, young people. Put your trust in Christ as Savior. Place your faith in the finished work of the cross. Raise your hand during an invitation. Come forward to the front of the auditorium and pray to accept Christ with a counselor. Be born again by accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. I am not saying, please hear me, I am not saying that those messages, those sound bites, are wrong. They all contain essential truth. What I am saying is that there's something missing. What's missing? The kingdom and repentance. Why? Who decided that we could change the message? Who decided to drop that out when that was the center stage of Jesus' gospel? Why would we remove it? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's confrontational. When you're told God wants to take over in your world, that the government of God is available, the king himself has arrived. Repent. Repent means to change sides. Let's just take a look at that for a moment. Why does it matter? Because essentially the Bible defines sin as an authority problem, a conflict over the issue of control. My kingdom versus God's kingdom. This is the problem that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was designed to solve. <coughs> if your experience of salvation has not changed who's in control of your life, you didn't understand what salvation was supposed to do. Salvation is not about getting your barcode so that you can get past the pearly gates. It's not about getting your ticket for heaven punched. It's not about just getting rid of your guilt and the sense of impending consequence for your sin. It's about changing sides. It's about getting back under the leader of the universe because that's what's going wrong. So sin is a kingdom issue. And as a kingdom issue, it inevitably produces hostility and animosity and conflict toward God. And the crucifixion of Jesus demonstrates how far human beings will go to preserve and protect their kingdoms. What were the people who crucified Jesus doing? Why did they kill him? 
so they could stay in control. So what is repentance? It's largely misunderstood in our evangelical world. It's an appropriate response to authority. Heaven's leader has arrived and is present. When Jesus was here on earth, what do you do when the ultimate leader is there in front of you? What's the appropriate response? Bow. Right? Amen. Hey, how you doing, Jesus? <laughs> you know, nice that you can see me. It's, there's something in us that even if it was Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, I'm not bowing to Him. I'm my own man. I'm not going to be intimidated by death's ultimate leadership. <laughs> the only appropriate thing to do when heaven's authority is in front of you is to give up. In Scripture, repentance is always connected or consistently connected to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of God is here. Repent. It means literally to turn from one kingdom to another or to change sides. Now this is where I get into uh, a reaction with some people. There are folks, good-hearted people, who say, but that's a work. And it's by faith, by grace through faith, salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. So if I give up, I'm adding to my salvation. That is so insane. There's nothing about working when you give up. Think about it. If I quit fighting God, if I stop resisting God, that is not working, that is giving up. Okay, Pastor Mark comes up, and he and I are going to arm wrestle right here on the communion table, all right? Uh, I understand that he works out. In fact, I, I'm staying down in his basement, and he has a, you know, one of those machines. <laughs> I don't do that. I do some curls, but, you know. <laughs> if you saw us red in the face, perspiration coming down, we're just, we're just trying to beat the other guy. When does the work stop? When somebody gives up. Right? That's so hard for some people to get in grasp. Surrender, repentance, is part of believing. You bow and believe. You repent and place your faith in Christ. It means I'm through living my own life for myself. I do not want to go any longer. I have made such a mess of it. I've done what was right in my own eyes. I've done what I thought I needed to do to be happy, and I have messed it up so bad. Jesus, would you take over? Be my Lord and my Savior. And he's made that possible through the cross. He was your substitute on the cross. He did die in your place. He will forgive your sins. But all of that is about a divine takeover. He wants to come back to being God in your life. I close with this. Here's three different reactions. These, uh, these people are individual castles. And by the way, this, these are the castles of the heart. I tried to depict this. What we do is we wall ourselves off so we can stay in control. Here's a guy who says, yeah, I'm a Christian. I invited Jesus into my life, but what he doesn't tell you is that his self is still on the throne, and Jesus is in his life, 
but has to do what he tells him to. In other words, Jesus is in my life, I'm a Christian, but I'm still in control. All right, here's a lady, and uh, she has a very busy life. She has compartmentalized it just to remain sane. So she's got children, uh, kids, she's got financial issues and problems, never enough at the end of the month. She's got friends, uh, entertainment, hobbies, the house, her marriage. And she calls herself a Christian because one of the categories of her life is Jesus and church. Now, the, the categories don't mix very well. She's in control of most of the categories. But Jesus is, is in control of the spiritual side of her life, the church life. And she calls herself a Christian. And here's a guy who calls himself a Christian, and what has happened here is that he has surrendered. And when this, this chair that I'm drawing here is a throne, every one of us has one in the center of our being, in our heart. And Jesus is on the throne of this man's life. And self is at his feet. What I'm trying to tell you folks is this. The Christian life in these two places will not work. This style with the guy, Jesus can be in my life as long as he lets me have control. I'll go to church. I'll serve. I'll give. But I'll decide. I'm in control. The, the lady who has this cluttered, busy, over busy life, and Jesus is just one piece of it, and the rest of it she has to manage and control, that's not going to work. There's going to be no transformation. In other words, these people are not going to be like Jesus. Transformation only happens here. When Jesus Christ is allowed to be God in your life, in your personal world, everything changes. Would you bow with me in prayer? Now, I don't know whether you call yourself a Christian or not. Some of you might be here today and you wouldn't yet put that label on yourself. But I'm inviting you right now, right where you're sitting, to just say, Lord Jesus, I get it. You're absolutely right. I am a control freak. I am self-centered. I do think I know better than you how to run my life. And I can understand how that would be so offensive to you. You created me. You have the right to my life. And I have pushed you out. But I'm coming home. I'm repenting right now. I'm giving up. I want you to take over. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for making the cleansing of my heart possible. Thank you for bearing the consequences of my rebellion. I accept that. But will you accept me as your follower? And those of you who think you're a Christian because you prayed a prayer, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, would you rethink it? Has the Christian life worked for you? Is there power? Is transformation happening? Are you becoming more like Jesus day after day, week after week? Or are you haunted by the same old issues and problems? This would be a good time to say, Lord, maybe I didn't get it. I want the whole thing. I want your kingdom in my world. I want your wonderful, loving leadership over 
over my life. I will bow. I will surrender. I do so right now. Father, do your work in us by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jan. In the foyer, there is a table with uh, a bunch of these brochures. This is a 12-page uh, booklet. It could function as a tract. It sort of lays out these ideas in a, just an easy-to-read, colorful, well-presented format. Uh, is there one per car, I guess? So don't, you don't go home and discover there's five of these in your back seat. There's one per car, and uh, you uh, read these over and then put them in the hands of the, put them in the place where they do the most good. You're dismissed. Thank you. Come back in just a few minutes.